Uh, oh, we are live. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lee Walton. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, I'd like to um, kick things off by uh, just saying it's really special to be back at SPX uh, many years after our, our previous appearance here and 25 years since uh, the launch of Top Shelf as an entity uh, by Chris Staros and Brett Warnock all those years ago at SPX 97. Um, so this place has always been very special to the identity of Top Shelf. Uh, when I joined the company in 2007, it instantly became my favorite weekend of the year. Uh, and it's been just a wonderful pilgrimage to come back again and again. So I'm very happy to be here with all of you, with all of you. Um, I'm, uh, as I said, joined the company in 2007. My name's Lee Walton. I was the marketing guy for a really long time. Just recently, I've transitioned to being senior editor now because uh, we have a, a wonderful marketing team uh, tackling that side of things. And Chris and I get to focus on making the books great. Um, and I'd just like the rest of our panel to introduce themselves real quick. Uh, start with you, Jennifer. I'm Jennifer Hayden. And uh, uh, well, I'm the author and artist of the story of my tits. And I've been doing this for a while. And Top Shelf is my absolute favorite publisher. And I love them dearly. So happy 25th. That's required for all of you to say. <laughs> It's in your contract. Yeah, I'm, I'm Chris Staros. I'm the editor-in-chief of Top Shelf and a former publisher and co-founder with Top Shelf Inc. with, with Brett Warnock. And I'm um, real happy to be here this weekend. Uh, I'm, I'm Jeffrey Brown. And should I give this one? Yeah, you got it. I am Jeff, whoa. Okay, that's, <laughs> I'm Jeffrey Brown. Uh, and Top Shelf was my first publisher besides myself. Um, 20 years ago, they published Clumsy, my first book, and um, just this year, I released the collection of my th first three autobiographical books, Loved and Lost. Hey, y'all. Uh, I'm Nate Powell, and uh, I've been working with Top Shelf since about 2005. Uh, our first book together was Please Release. And uh, I had a very, like, very healthy correspondence through the mail with both Brett and Chris in the years before that that really helped me cultivate enough chops to make enough sense that someone else would publish my books. And so, uh, yeah, Top Shelf has been a very instrumental part of my path of, you know, trying to communicate ideas with power and clarity to the world and uh, has always functioned as a, as a, you know, sort of a family entity to me as well. Hi, um, I'm Hannah Templer, and uh, Top Shelf is my first publisher as well. Um, and I've been working with them since about 2017 is when I signed, and my first book, Cosmo Nights, came out in 2019, so. Hi, I'm Jared Oh, you can stay on your mic, and I think they will handle the volume levels. Just give them a second. No? OK, need to share, sorry. I'm Jared Rosello. Um, uh, I'm the author of the middle grade graphic novel series, Red Panda and Moon Bear. Um, Top Shelf was the publisher whose books made me want to start making my own comics. And so, you know, it took a while, but um, it felt kind of full circle for me to finally come back and, and publish my own books with them, so. That's awesome. Uh, I love hearing that Top Shelf books are what made people excited about comics. That was certainly true for me. Um, and I think we all owe a lot to the original vision of Top Shelf. So I guess I want to ask Chris, like, if Top Shelf made all of us excited about comics, what made you excited about making Top Shelf? Well, you know, ironically, I never read comics as a kid. When I was real little, my parents told me that books with pictures in them were for little kids and books without pictures in them were for grown ups. So I really tried hard to stay away from books with pictures as a kid. And, you know, I would read Dune and the Tolkien series and things like that and try to grow up as fast as I could, right? And so I really did discover comics when I was about 30 years old and I, I um, uh, was blown away by things like uh, V for Vendetta and Love and Rockets and just was amazed by how incredibly good they were. Like if you took the best of literature and the best of film and combined them together, you had comics. But that's not what comics were at that time. And and because I have a kind of a crap memory, I would take notes on what I really liked about a particular book, where I got it from, how to, how to get copies of it, and so forth. And I started compiling these notes on all these great books. And for about four years, between like 90 and 94, I just did nothing but read comics. Like I was doing my own master's thesis on what was happening in the indie world. And by the end of that four years, I had enough notes that I thought, you know, it's disappointing to me that the comic shops are not caring 
these hundred titles that I think are the best things being published in comics right now. So, so started a little zine called The Star Wars Report, which was my guide to like where the best things were. And again, this was pre-email and pre-internet, so it was like put uh, $12 plus 350 postage in an envelope, mail it to this post office and you can get this book, you know, that sort of thing. And I remember uh, not knowing what to do with this zine at the time. And I, uh, when I got to the second one, which was a little better than the first, there was only 40 copies of the first one. There were 2,000 of the second one. Didn't know really what to do with them. But one thing I did was some research where all the great comic book shops were. And I mailed 25 to each of them and said, just sell them. You know, they're a gift. And some probably threw them away. But I started getting mail from all over the country. And one of the places I got mail from was a guy named Chris Orr who lived here in uh, DC. This was in 95, 94. And they had just started the SBX, and he was getting involved with it. And he said, dude, uh, he wrote me an 11-page letter, by the way, a handwritten. <laughs> and, um, and it was too long for me to like, respond to. So I just looked him up in the white pages and called him and said, hey, what's up, man? He goes, dude, you should bring your stuff to the Small Press Expo. There's a new convention up here, and you know, check it out. And I'm like, what's a convention? I literally was that naive. I had no idea that there was fandom, that people got together and sold stuff. He goes, um, he go, I go, nobody's going to want my little stupid zine. Nobody's going to buy it in a public forum. And they said, no, no, you should see the crap people bring up. People buy your stuff. And, like, <laughs> and uh, so I crashed on his couch and I drove up. I actually sold 100 copies of my zine at the second SPX in 1995. And that's where I started to, you know, slowly, from a wallflower to slowly get to know, like, the people on this panel and other people and get more involved. And, uh, started agenting some people first and then eventually decided to start publishing. And that's where I met Brett Warnock on the scene. He was doing fanzines and mini comics at the time and then we got together and we kind of were becoming friends in Chris Ward's house because we were both crashing there and basically on the couch while we were hanging out one night in 97, we said let's join forces because he had a really cool design sense. He had a really good sense of presentation. I had maybe slightly more business mind. I was a little more editorial. We made a good match. And the idea of Top Shelf at the beginning, as Lee was talking about, was to really bring comics to the masses, to take the best of literature and film and art and make something that would appeal outside of the insular world of superhero comics to the world at large. And I think that was the mission, really, of all the publishers at the Small Press Expo, this wave of the 80s and 90s and so forth, to try to legitimize comics as a literary art form. And so that's been our mission, to package stuff as books, not as serialized floppies, things that could be just sold in bookstores and libraries and other sort of thing. And that mission, to a certain extent, has come true. And so we're proud of that, to have creators this strong be able to do books that would appeal to outside the comics industry. Awesome, thank you, Chris. Uh, uh, Brett Warnock's not able to be with us here, but as one of the co-founders of the company and the guy that first hired me, uh, and he's still very much plugged into the scene. Uh, he's actually got his own magazine that he's running now called Kitchen Table, uh, and is uh, currently doing a crowdfunding campaign for it. So you can Google Brett Warnock Kitchen Table Magazine, help support that. He sent us a little statement here. 25 years, WTF. Uh, Chris Starrs and myself may have met for the first time in San Diego. But Small Press Expo is where we laid the ground for, groundwork for what Top Shelf Productions would become. When Staros walked up to me in Chris Orr's living room and asked if I wanted to join forces, it took me all of five seconds to say yes. Between the two of us, over the following umpteen years, we must have tabled at well over a couple hundred shows. But nothing ever matched those early, heady years in the mid-90s in the old Bethesda Holiday Inn. What other convention had a backyard launch party with a pit-roasted pig and a pinata? Looking back, you know, maybe not every project has stood the test of time. No publisher's output ever does. But I am incredibly proud of what Chris and I accomplished, from the award-winning graphic novels to the obscure projects that never would have seen the light of day otherwise. And the fact that our efforts helped shepherd numerous creators, from self-published mini-comics creator into successful career comic book maker. That's what it's all about. I made so many friendships through Top Shelf and Small Press Expo that I still have to this day. So thank you, Brett. And we're definitely feeling his spirit in the room with us today. Yeah, and Brett and I were really, we, he lived in Portland, Oregon. I lived in Marietta, Georgia at the time we ran the company across. And then Lee lived in Seattle for a while, then in New York. So we were, we were truly a FedEx internet COVID friendly company for the whole time, right? And uh, Brett and I have been the best friends for our whole lives during our entire 
um, partnership with Topshop, we never had a single argument about anything ever. And we always had a two thumbs up policy, like if he didn't want to do something, we didn't do it. If I didn't want to do something, we didn't do it. We never fought about it. We, if we both wanted to do something, we did it together. And um, really, it was a, oftentimes business partnerships do not work that smoothly, especially over the long term. You find out things about people you weren't, didn't really know when you got involved, but Brett's a true prince of a human being and one of my best friends to this day still. So. Awesome. Uh, maybe do any of you got any of you authors want to share a story about when you first noticed Top Shelf or what drew you uh, to us as a publisher? I remember. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I think it was ninety nine, or it may have been two thousand. Uh, but I know that I picked up a book before. It was probably an early James Kolchaka book. Uh, but what really took me in was Goodbye Chunky Rice. Uh, so that first printing of Goodbye Chunky Rice uh, was just mesmerizing to me. And at that time, I guess I would have been finishing up school at SBA. And at the time, you know, I had a couple of fires burning in my mind that I was trying to turn into stories and, try, and still on a self-publishing path. But I had made a choice, uh, still thinking in a very like DIY punk, postal communication way where I made a list of about 15 creators, editors, and publishers whose work I like, or whose work I liked and responded to. And I decided the best approach would simply be to send a copy of everything I published to everyone on that list and see who bit back. Um, and of that list, yeah, on, only a few people wrote back but of those few people, it was Brett and Chris at Top Shelf who actually started basically a postal correspondence. Uh, but I, I, I guess it would have been the first issue of Walkie Talkie that I would have sent, or maybe Conditions. Um, and I don't remember if it was you or Brett who wrote back, but that very first letter, it was like, oh yeah, thanks for, for sending me this, but it actually included real constructive criticism uh, that kind of didn't, you know, it, it wasn't fluffy and it didn't mess around, but it was actually encouraging, but actually pushed back a little bit. Uh, and it sort of felt vindicating where I was like, okay, this, this plan of mine is working. So for the next thing I publish, I'm gonna send them in again. And now my list had kind of narrowed. And over those years, then I remember Brett would send packages with like, who knows what happened with these silk screens, but just like, oh, hey man, we're working on this new book, it's called Blankets, here's like a super limited edition silk screen poster, and you know, all kinds of stuff that I'm sure just like has wound up underneath, you know, like a pile of garbage in my parents' house somewhere. Um, but like these, these treasures where suddenly I was becoming a part of a world and I hadn't yet attended a real comic convention yet, that I could sense the edges of this community that we know now. Um, and so along the way, then I started pitching whole book ideas, uh, and I, I remember pitching It Disappears to you guys, and you guys had the thumbs up, thumbs down split, mm -hmm. and, which I really respected, because I, I actually got a nice, fully formed response about it that, again, was encouraging but constructive uh, as a critique of the work, and just kind of pushed me uh, you know, to get a little less out of my head and be working on storytelling with a little more clarity. And so I really think you, Chris, along the way for being like, okay, here are your weaknesses in your storytelling, Nate. I'm gonna walk you through these couple of steps and here are these three things I want you to focus on. And uh, yeah, we had just a long sort of creative and editorial correspondence for many years that really helped me develop a sense of how to communicate very far reaching ideas in a more accessible way. Actually, it was Jeffrey Brown's book, Clumsy, that made me want to do this. So, like, and it's in here, too. I have a panel showing the pile of stuff. I, I came to comics very late. I had had breast cancer. I was recuperating, and I read about uh, graphic novels in the New York Times. I always like to say the New, York, the New York Times is generally the last person to be in on any art form. <laughs> so if you had to wait till, till then, you probably missed it, but... Actually, people were still making them, and I actually first was reading only the female written titles. And then I found your work, and I decided to give you the title of Honorary Lady Comics Person. <laughs> because you had so much heart in your work, and there was such um, 
vulnerability. And uh, there was some panel of you sitting, you were waiting for your girlfriend to call and, um, and you went and you had to use the bathroom and you put the phone, this is pre-cell phones, down on the linoleum next to the toilet, and it's just a picture of you, your pants, and the phone, something like that. And I just was going, oh my God, you know, so much heart is possible in this stuff. And I had been a failed writer and a failed illustrator, and I was looking for a, a forum where I could A, swear, B, tell stories, and C, draw pictures, and I found it. <laughs> but um, I remember very much, so I saw that you were published by Top Shelf, and a number of other books that I had gotten also said Top Shelf. So I was like, well, this guy can't be bad. And I, can't, and I sent my stuff to you, and <laughs> your response, um, uh, was it a letter or an email? I don't remember. Probably it was an email. And at the bottom you said, your friend through comics, Chris. <laughs> And I assumed that that was a very personally, you know, that you would come up with that just for me. And that you were my friend now in comics. And I was like, oh my God, I love these guys. So anyway, I uh, lived in uh, near New York and I'd grown up there. So the first convention I went to was um, New York Comic Con. Can you imagine? I actually kept going to conventions after that. And I showed up and I had a list of publishers that I had sent the first eight pages of this book to. And, uh, and I uh, went to see each of them, and they were each a little cold, a little breezy. And then I reached this southern gentleman who talked to me for probably an hour about absolutely nothing. And I was just so, I, was, I just thought you were the best. And I thought, this is the publisher for me. And unfortunately, it took me a long time to get him, get <laughs> Chris to, um, to agree to publish my book because he was it was not it was not stunning at the very outset but eventually uh, he took it and I I couldn't have been happier it was it was perfect but the I call uh, Chris the Prince of Comics because I find him to be a complete gentleman and uh, both as a reader and literary support and as a friend and everything else so anyway well thank you that's both leaders are under very, and very enlightening and wonderful to hear us. Uh, you know, Top Shelf has always been a very hands-on editorial outfit. Uh, myself, uh, Brad, and Lee, and Lee's an amazing editor as well, that we spend a lot of time with the creators if they need it, you know, to, to talk about story, or art, improvements, you know. We, we try to be like the devil's advocate on things that we find maybe confusing or not so clear because it's important to us that works be definitive and not formative, you know, so that, so that they, if you're going to spend that much time drawing them, let's make them as good as they can and, and get them out there. And then also, you know, when I was younger, I was a musician, I know it's hard to sort of see it now, but I used to play in metal bands for, uh, for 11 years. And we were always trying to make it, we never did. But, you know, I would send cassette tapes, you know, to labels back in the 70s and 80s, you know, trying to get record labels to pay attention. And I, I literally was crickets, you know. I, I could tell you some great stories of me breaking into record companies and, and actually demanding audiences and getting audiences with my stuff. But for the most part, it was always crickets. Nobody ever responded. And I made a promise to myself when I was like 20 years old, like if I ever get into a position in the arts where people send me stuff, I will always write back. Because I hated, I don't mind no. I, I like yeses, I don't mind noes. I just don't like the silence or just being ignored. You know, like I really wanted to, to for somebody to at least have seen the stuff and had a thought process about it. So every day, my first thing I do every day is read all the submissions that come to me and write letters to everybody. I, I, I always have done that. You're not, you're not the only person I've said you're a friend through comics. <laughs> it's on the I website. Don't, I, don't, <laughs> I don't use that tagline as much as I used to, but I did for 20 years. Like That was always my sign-off on every letter. Because comics is such a community. Like The friendship and the support that cartoonists give each other and that we all give each other in the room, because it's not about fighting over a slice of pie. It's starting to make the pie bigger and for, let, introduce more and more people to comics. You know, So that's been fun. So that's been nice. And those, a lot of times, responding to people created relationships and back and forth and discussions and sometimes the works would evolve a little bit and then we'd jump on them and sign them and bring them into the family. Yeah, I think that's, that's kind of how I started with Top Shelf was, so I had sent um, the first Xeroxed copy of Clumsy, so it was 200 pages, but it was Xeroxed like a, like a 
traditional mini comic, and I'd sent it into Top Shelf, um, who I knew mostly from James Kachalka, and I was also really like Josh Simmons comics, and um, and I had sent a copy to James, and James was I think um, like nudging Chris and Brett that they should they should publish Clumsy, and um, but I got the reply from Brett, and he's like, I'm sorry, like. I really want to do this book, um, it but did take Chris, a minute to realize it was Chris Jeffrey said Sprint's. no. Yes, I don't. Um, <laughs> but but um, I don't I don't think I don't think it was a letter or an email. I think you actually called me, and and Chris said, you know, look, we I don't think we, it's the right time for us to publish this, but if you decide to self-publish, we'll help you get it out there. We'll help you distribute. And so I when I self-published. Top Shelf took copies and were selling online. And like this was like early days, and I had like no idea how to sell online, so I was all too happy to have someone help out. Um, and they were bringing, like when they would go to shows, they'd have all the Top Shelf books, and they had a couple copies of my books at, at the conventions they started going to. Um, and then I, I met Chris and Brett in person at, at SPX in 2002. Um, and just continued corresponding. And, and it got to the point where Chris uh, asked me, he's like, you know, we, we're doing pretty well with this book. Do you, do you want to like solicit it through Diamond? Like you can solicit it under top shelf, like, but it'll still be your, your book. Your... And I was like, yeah, that sounds like, I think, I think we're like ready for that. And so we did that and the pre-orders came back and I think it was for like 1,200 copies or something like that. And I had about 1,000 copies left of my, my self-published run. And um, at that point, Chris said, well, like, if you want to keep self-publishing, like, you can do that. Or like, we'll take over. Like, we'll become your publisher. And I was like, um, looking at my apartment with all the boxes of books, and I thought, yeah, I'd like, I don't think I need more boxes of books. So um, I, I was happy. And then. Um, yeah, so that then from then on, Top Shelf was, was a publisher. Yeah, that, and that was interesting because I am a huge fan of Jeffrey Brown's work, but the very first time I saw it, it didn't click with me at the moment. And he was uh, way ahead of his time. And his deceptively simple line strokes convey so much emotion. Like one of the things I, you learn over time with comics is that the important thing is to communicate that human emotion and just perfect ways in every panel. And there's not a single line in Jeffrey's comics that are out of place, even though it might look like they are when you first just glance at them without any knowledge sometimes on his earlier stuff. And at, at some point it just clicked for me and I realized, oh my God, he's so far ahead of his time. And I, I was wrong about that. I mean, Brett was right and I was wrong about it. It took me about 12 months to catch up with, with Jeffrey's work. And of course, we've had a great relationship for 20 years since then and published a, published a lot of things. But, you know, sometimes, you could be ahead of the curve or behind the curve, catch up, you know, never know how it's going to evolve. <laughs> All right, so since we're having this conversation about Jeffrey, it sounds like, um, <laughs> I remember the day that I knew I wanted to make comics. I was, I graduated high school, it was probably the first or second year of college, and I was working at a comic book store and just reading everything, and I didn't love anything that I was reading. I found stuff, I was like, this is cool, this is cool, and then tucked on a shelf was a copy of Clumsy, and I pulled it out and I opened it and I was just like in love. And I knew that I had to go home and like make comics like immediately. And, and that book was such a good primer for comics because it also reveals how comics are made just by looking at it. Like you can see his lines, you can see how you build a book. And so I was like, I have to go home and I have to do this. So I went home, that's when I started making mini comics. And then in probably like two, 2008 or 2009, I forget, either at SPX or New York Comic Con, I brought my minis and I gave them to Chris. And then, you know, like a, like a few days later, I sent a follow-up email and you said, these are really great. When you have an idea for a book, let me know. And that, you know, probably like Jennifer, I was like, wow, he said that to me and he meant that. <laughs> and so like 10 years later, almost to the, to the year, to the month, I had this idea for a book and I said, hey, remember you said, <laughs> when I have an idea for a book, here it is. And then it, it happened and we made a book. And so, I mean, part of getting connected in the industry is that slow progress, you know, putting, having the confidence to put something out there and the humility to know the next thing you do is going to be a lot better. Self-publish, 
get something out there, let that slow relationship build between getting to know somebody, having a beer with somebody, seeing their work, seeing it improve. And then since Top Shelf was more of a full-length graphic novel publisher for the most part, that's where we were trying to focus. You know, sometimes you have to develop a little bit to be able to tell longer stories like that, and that takes a little while. And um, so a lot of these relationships just sort of evolve organically over time into something that's really, really strong. Everybody's looking at Anna now, I'm sorry. Hi. Um, it's interesting because I feel like I have a very di a different path to finding Top Shelf in comics, but I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, I feel really lucky to be working with Top Shelf. I, for a long time, was just self-publishing like 10-page zines in my apartment um, while I was working a graphic design job, and I was kind of lost with what I wanted to do. I really wanted to make comics, but uh, I was tied to like my full-time day job and didn't really know how to spend more time doing it. And then in 2017, like I had a big shape up, shake up in my life and decided like, this is what I wanna do, this is what I wanna make. So I started with this book and it's actually a web comic. Um, so it, I posted online for free and I had been posting the prologue of this comic. This was, I mean, in 2016, is when mm. we first talked, yeah. So I had posted the, and um, I was familiar with Top Shelf, like I had been at My Sexpo and had seen like strong female protagonists and like a few different books and was like vaguely aware of publishers but was really very much in like self-publishing and had no idea what I was doing, just kind of like had this energy to start making comics seriously. And Lee emailed me um, kind of out of the blue and it was really like really great timing for me just because I again, had just gotten serious about this and I had a lot of drive to make this happen. And Lee, Lee was like, is this lesbian Pacific Rim? That's what you said in like one of your first emails. And I was like, huh, yeah, that sounds great. Like, yeah, kind of. Um, and it kind of like took off from there. I was, um, again, just really excited to actually make something. And I think this speaks a little bit to kind of what you were talking about at the beginning about like creating comics for the masses that were a little like just different. Like I had a very specific vision for the comic I wanted to make and I wasn't necessarily, um, I don't know, like I wasn't necessarily plugged into like the comic scene in a kind of like very mainstream way. Like I, I didn't really know like what kind of like what I wanted to read but I knew what I wanted to make if that makes sense. And then as I got more plugged in I was finding more artists who I really identified with and got really excited about um, and yeah. It's been really great. I feel like I have like a lot of creative freedom with you guys and um, a lot of trust, and it's really exciting. So, we also like did a lot of editorial back and forth on yes. Cosmo Nights. Yes, yes. Um, and I'm grateful that you were willing to let me barge into your girls' club and be like, <laughs> "Hey, what about if this character was different and X, Y, and Z?" Yeah. And you know, you would push back when you felt strongly about something, but I really. I value so much, and you know, I've taken that mentorship from Chris about like how to talk with authors about like what do you want to come across here? Where is that not happening? And where am I getting confused? Or here's a suggestion: Does that resonate with you? And you take the ones that resonate and you fold that into the book, and it comes out a lot stronger. I think. Yeah, can I speak that a little Please. bit? Please. Yeah, I was also to add to that. So yeah, I had been working on this independently, and as soon as I started working with an editor, this was the first time I'd worked with an editor on a story, and it was. Yeah, super, super helpful to get feedback and to understand uh, kind of how to construct a story and what was getting across and what wasn't. And um, obviously I have like a lot of creative freedom, which I'm grateful for, a lot of trust again, which I appreciate. But um, yeah, just I have like come to really, really appreciate the like the, the combination of feedback and trust that kind of leads to a great story and communicating exactly what you truly want to communicate and pushing the story to a place that's um, like more than it could have been on its own. So, yeah, definitely. I love that. <sighs> <laughs> I've, I'm sorry, I've just been soaking up all the good stories. Um, Bathe in it. Chris, I, there's one seismic event that happened in top shelf history before I came on that feels, it felt seismic and I think resonated for years afterwards, which was the day we almost went under, oh, or yeah. that you almost went under. Yeah. And uh, how the magic email that saved the company. Do you want to tell the short version of that one? So, you know, originally comic books or graphic novels were only sold in comic book stores. And really it wasn't until around the year 2000 where 
the, the media at large and libraries and Entertainment Weekly and the public watch really started to pay attention to the graphic novel form, I, you know, and even though every article at the time was Biff Bang Pow, comics aren't just for kids anymore, you know, and it took five years before that wasn't the title of every article. But now, you know, everybody knows what a graphic novel is. People know when movies are based on them. They're in libraries everywhere. And, and really the, the, the dream we all had about the graphic novel growing up did. But when it started out, nobody was distributing comics. Uh, Amazon.com was just sort of getting started. The, the uh, libraries did not carry graphic novels. They were too worried about the pictures being offensive and so forth. They hadn't really started that. They weren't in bookstores. Barnes & Noble Borders did not carry graphic novels or any of that. And, um, and Penguin Random House and Diamond were not distributing books to bookstores. So it was just not an open market. It was a new company at that time called LPC that had was ahead of the game in the sense of thinking that this stuff might really sell well in bookstores. So they picked up a lot of publishers, including Dark Horse and Drona Corley, Top Shelf and others, and started distributing things to the book trade. This is right about the time the From Hell movie was coming out, and we were publishing the, gra the graphic novel From Hell. And so we went and spent a lot of money printing a ton of books, thousands of books, to, to put in the bookstores to go along with the movie. They did really well. They sold really well. In fact, they sold out. And... Um, uh, and, and then they took a lot of other of our books as well. But ultimately, they were in much shakier financial shape than, uh, any, than anyone knew. And they went bankrupt. One day, they just stopped returning phone calls. Well, they stuck us with an enormous amount of printing bills and no revenue and never paid us for any of the books that we had dis distributed with them, which was a year's worth of inventory. And so we were, had an enormous amount of bills lined up and no cash. So we basically were... We're bankrupt. Our email list at the time had about 5,000 people on it. And I composed, I thought, a very well-written letter about, you know, this is what's happened to us. Basically, a giant tree has fallen on us. You know, I know a lot of you talk about maybe buying a Top Shelf book one day, and maybe one day you will, but today is the day. <laughs> like, if you're going to buy a Top Shelf book, today is the day. And it turned out to be the first crowdfunding campaign in comics because it was an online plea for money. This was at a time when people did not want to put their credit cards online. And, um, and so um, I sent out that email at 8 o'clock in the morning. And all of a sudden, some, I noticed some, it was starting to ricochet. Like Neil Gaiman forwarded it to his email list. Warren Ellis posted it to his message boards. There, a lot of big players decided to jump in and say, hey, support these guys. By the end of that day, by 8 o'clock that night, our little puny online website and web store had raised $100,000 in one 12-hour period. Oh, wow. And we were completely back in business by the evening of that message. I should have milked it for five more days. I sent out a thank you the next morning to tell everybody we were back in business. I should have just let that email slide for a few days. But I, I was so <laughs> shocked that the, the community rallied. I wanted the community to know how strong it was together, like, and how appreciative we were of it, and, and, and the love that the community had for each other in supporting these things. So I never forgot that, and I was always grateful for that moment. And, you know, and we've been around ever since, so we, the last 20 years of publishing would have not have existed were it not for the comics community um, supporting us, so never forgot that. That's great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, what other milestones jump out for you guys as, uh, I don't know, memorable anecdotes. Uh, I know Nate and I have been on some wild adventures together, uh, thanks to the Marsh Trilogy, which has taken us places we never expected. Well, obviously, you know, Nate's contribution to March was incredible. And, and March is one of those touchstones where a book truly reached outside of the comics market to the world at large and really introduced people t to um, comics. And, so that's a, those are some phenomenal events. And, you know, publishers really don't have that many events that go that large that often, you know, so you appreciate them when they come along. But I had Nate in the back of my head when I talked to John Lewis and Andrew about doing that book and w needing an artist. And I needed somebody who was had indie credibility and indie style, but also a style that could kind of cross over into realism and the, and what people would want to see in a sort of mainstream comic and, and Nate is the perfect balance of that. He's also politically aligned to the message and an, an activist in that sense and also not only a great artist but 
fast. Like nobody can keep up with, <laughs> with Nate Powell. And uh, even we, though we almost killed him with deadlines on, the, on those books too, you know, because we're trying to reach such historical milestones so John Lewis could give a speech on the 50th anniversary of the, I can have a dream speech and these kind of big moments in time that would really resonate with an audience. But that was a big moment. Blankets was a big moment. I, all of the books on this table were big moments. I mean, I love all my children the same to, you know, I, it, they scale differently in audience, but that's never, never bothered me one way or another. I publish things because I love the story, I love the art, and that there's unique art that I'm not seeing normally, that there's, there's stories that have a lot of subtext and a lot of heart, those are things that resonate with me. And also people that I like as human beings, I, I really don't want to work with people I don't like because th th this is a dream job for me, I don't want to turn it to a nightmare, you know? So I, the people on this table I really love dearly and have a great time putting out books with them. So that was the plan, you know. I still think that's a leading quality of this publisher is that the, it's, it's got a, a huge heart and all the books that I read that had the top shelf logo on them were full of heart and really reached me. And I had, you know, I was doing this as my life's work after thinking I might die and I wasn't going to be fooling around, you know, and I wanted somebody who was going to have, um, you know, the same desire to touch human beings that I had at that time, which was really intense, and Top Shelf had that. And I knew that because I, I kept going to shows even after New York Comic Con, and I started going to the New York shows and to SPX, and I talked Chris's ear off every single time, and then started talking Lee's ear off, and you know, I, people just tell me to shut up. It's it's hard. I keep flapping, but I I always always appreciated how you talked about people, how you talked about the work that was getting done and the books themselves, and and one after another, it would be a story that would be. Um, it wasn't just the art. It wasn't just the writing. I I I. I for me, the humanity, um, the reaching out to other humans and the meeting of hearts in, in comics is so much more direct than it is for me in fiction, in you know, regular books, in, 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 um, in illustration and lots of other things. And so uh, that's, I just think that's a particular quality of the books you publish and, the, and, the, and March is in, for for all the tremendous things that it is, it is incredibly full of heart, you know, and that's uh, and and the way Nate goes after it um, and figures out how to make that story live for you and make you care about it. So I think that's a forte, you know, that you guys have, and it makes me um, know that it could only have been you guys, because even when I gave it to you, when when um, uh, Chris. Uh, Oh God, what is his last name? Um, the designer, the book designer. Chris Ross. Chris Ross was designing it. And he sent me, you know, what do you think if we do this? And we, and I, and, uh, and I had a little book before this that was um, called Underwire and he designed that too. And, and when I saw it, I was like, so is this a woman who did this? You know, it, because there weren't very many titles by women in, from Top Shelf at that point. And I had people actually tell me, congratulations for busting into the boys club. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? They're really nice. They're they're all kind of like ladies, um, but the it, the design was so sensitive to what I was doing visually and thematically that I just had assumed it. I'm so prejudiced. I just assumed it was a a chick, and you know he and he was, um, you know he was also so full of heart. He was so great to work with, and and when I met him anyway, meeting Brett Warnock and meeting. Uh, Chris, were were two enormous moments for me um, working with you guys. So. Shout out to Chris Ross. Yeah, I I want to say yeah, Chris Ross, my favorite designer I've ever worked with for specifically that reason. He's the the only, re really the only designer where every single book he wants to have multiple one and a half hour long phone conversations that start with the highest concept that's being carried throughout the book. And he wants to have these like overarching conversations where you have these, like he actually dares, he has the audacity to interject his own perspective 
uh, his aesthetic and life perspective as a designer and wants to meet you halfway there. And he really establishes himself in this very gentle way where you want to give him the reins. He's like such a good listener. And uh, it, it feels amazing that, you know, I've, I've had great collaborations on other books with other designers, but it's, it's a, a very practical affair. But I actually feel like it's a true collaborative experience only with Chris Ross. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he's so great. Jennifer, I like what you said about, um, you know, the, the heart and the feeling that only that person could have made that book. I think mm -hmm. that's, that's a line that I use a lot when I talk about Top Shelf is this desire that when we publish a book and there's a reader reading it on the other end, there's a handshake that happens between the reader and the creator that feels very genuine and, and personal. And I, as I was listening to you today, I was reflecting like, Every book that is made is a miracle by any publisher, by any author, right? Like these things take so much time, comics even more than prose. And so nobody makes anything unless they really care about it and they pour their guts into it. But there's something about the kinds of books that we've been lucky enough to work with where you can feel the hand of the artist reaching out to you. You know, you guys were talking about Jeffrey's art style in his very first book where you can literally see the way that his hand moved as he drew that character. And I think that at least is metaphorically true on every, every one of these books that like, there's not that cynicism or that sense of like, I have to do it the professional way or I have to do what the market wants or, you know, and some of, some of it may be just like a psychological issue of like other authors may n need to create a wall of distance between themselves and the reader or between themselves and the content, mm -hmm. you know, but th that wall just doesn't feel like it's there with our books. Like these are people who are putting themselves on paper for you and reaching out to you. Um, and it's, it's so much fun working on your books. Like, I wouldn't be able to keep doing this if it was, it felt like just like cynical product that we were pumping out. Mm, mm. I think there's also something to Top Shelf's roster of creators that, like, I'm trying to think, is there anyone who's done a book with Top Shelf that I haven't gotten along with or wouldn't get along with? Um, and. I, like, I, I know Chris has talked about the Top Shelf family um, a lot, and like it really does feel like like it's like we're as creators like a family, and like that's one of my favorite things is over the years of having been able to meet so many different creators. Like like one of the um, creators I liked growing up was Eddie Campbell, and um, just being able to like go to the top shelf booth and sign my books and then around the corner for me is Eddie and and like every once in a while he'd like come over and give me some ad life advice or cartooning advice or just like advice like okay when you're at a convention Jeff like you should just stand behind the table don't just be sitting there the whole time and um, but yeah I, f I always feel like like there's a there's a certain sense of like heart to all the books but it's also, it's also like the creators as people are also all like like kind of nice good people. I I I know I'm talking too much and I apologize right now, but I have to tell an Eddie Campbell story quickly, an Eddie Campbell slash Chris Ross story, and it is so top shelf. I was nominated for an Eisner for this book, and so was March, and March won fair and square. But we were all at the table together, and. Um, and Chris Ross held my hand because I was going to have a heart attack as they announced the thing because my rotten husband wouldn't come with me to San Diego. And my rotten son, who I brought with me, had decided to go to a movie. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. And I was sitting there alone thinking, I'm going to have a heart attack. And so Chris Ross said, are you OK? Because I was probably purple. And he held my hand. And he said, we'll get through this. It's OK. So I lost. And afterwards, he took me to the bar, and he, gave, and he gave me so many drinks, and we planned my next book, which I still haven't finished, sorry. And in the course of it, he said, listen, I have a consolation prize for you. I want you to come and join us. Eddie Campbell, and he'd seen me go googly-eyed at Eddie Campbell at the booth that day, and he said, Eddie Campbell, um, I brought some wine down for him to try. And if you, and I know you like to drink, it's no secret. And he said, so you should come and find us downstairs and we'll all, we'll all drink this wine, you and Eddie Campbell and the rest of us. He had a seat 
right next to Eddie Campbell, open for me. Like I walked in, the, the wine was open, and, and I sat down, and I did not get up from that chair for five hours. I talked Eddie Campbell's head off. And he was so fascinating and so gorgeous and so much fun. And I just oozed about like all of his books. So that was possibly better than winning an Eisner. <laughs> Thank you, Top Shelf. <laughs> Well, where we've done a lot of reminiscing, and please feel free to jump in if you have more reminiscing to do. But I'm also kind of curious about those of you who are uh, part of the next generation, or those of you who are teaching the next generation in your work. Like, where do you see graphic novels going? Where do you see your own work evolving? Um, what do you want to do next with Top Shelf? What do you want Top Shelf to do next? Uh, but a, a, a relevant one, too. One of the things that I was thinking about also right, as we were prepping for this was how much Top Shelf is doing things before other people were doing them. Like before there was children's graphic novels everywhere, there was the Top Shelf Kids Club. Before there were website repositories of web comics, there was Top Shelf 2.0. Um, and the, the, doing these things before everybody else was doing them, too. And I've, I've wondered, too, a little bit about, similar to that question you asked me, about that kind of foresight to like look ahead to see what's coming down there next. I teach college classes, and my students are drawing you know, a lot of like manga-influenced comics, a lot of fantasy, a lot of horror. That's the, the, the kinds of stuff that I'm getting um, from, from them making these kinds of things. They're drawing from inspirations that are like all over the place, not just other comics or even other literature, but like film and television and you know all kinds of cool stuff and bringing them into this medium, which is a perfect medium for it because comics can handle so much difference and so much interesting things that can sort of contain them without ruining them, I think. And so... Um, yeah, I don't know, and, and it, it affects me. I, I work with kids when I'm making my comics because I feel like I need to know how a kid is talking and thinking and like what they're doing. So I go teach comics classes to kindergartners and then come home and like yeah. try to get that voice in my book so I can hear it. When I was playing in metal bands in the 80s, like we were, we were a good band, kind of like Scorpions, two lead guitar players, melodic vocalist kind of thing, right? And we had finally like reached our peak status where we were ready to take over the world around 88, just because of our ages, you know, when we got our start and got going. But I learned a very valuable lesson then because at that time it was grunge was starting to come up, metal was starting to go down. We were dead before we got started, right? It was the end of an era and the next wave was coming. And then when I think about it now in retrospect, the record companies were well aware of that in advance and they were looking for the next wave. They were looking for something. And it, and it got me, it was a hard lesson to learn, but when I kept, when I came to comics, is you don't want to be on the back of the wave, you don't want to be in the middle of the wave, you want to be on the front of the wave with something. So more of the same is not what publishers are looking for. So if you have work and you're bringing it to them and it looks like something that was done in the 80s or 90s or 2000s, or just more of stuff we've already published, it's not going to resonate with publishers. We want something with a fresh approach, something that the way you draw and the way you tell stories process through your head, your heart, and your hands in a way that other people are not doing it. And that is what Top Shelf has been trying to look for. Now, I've never considered myself a visionary or a, a, a revolutionary or any of that nature. I've never been that talented. But I am an evolutionary, and I work really, really hard. So my philosophy is just look at every opportunity every single day and chase it and work as hard as I can. And I'll know if I turn back five years later and look, there'll be a lot of distance travel behind me, and I will evolve. I will into a direction, you know? So while I, there might be not visionary elements going on here, I do try to really recognize front of the way talent when I can see it and jump on it and go, go in that direction. And, you know, and every once in a while, we'll hit one out of the park. And so will every other publisher and every self-publisher in the room. Every once in a while, you hit something out of the park. And I celebrate all those moments, not just for us, but for anybody in the room. I will high five anybody for doing something Great, because it's a triumph for the medium of comics, you know, all around. Um, well, just to speak a little bit to that as well, um, I can't predict the future of comics, obviously, but um, I think what was really exciting for me working with kind of like a web comic that was free and also making it in print is that it's, I love reading comics in print, and I really love sharing that with people, and I think people really like to own comics, especially like beautiful comics and comics that really mean something to them, like, 
I am always, I mean, I'm not surprised, but I'm always honored when people are like, I want to own your book. Like, even though I read it online, I want to own like a copy and I want to gift it. And um, for me, I think like, it's really cool that Top Shelf was there for that. I think bef like before a lot of other publishers were doing that too, where they were really there for um, kind of the substance and the idea of like my work and not necessarily like, um, I don't know, I didn't have a vision for like a traditional publishing route when I was making this comic. I was just like, I want to make the work that I'm gonna make. And Top Shelf like met me there, which I think was really special for me and super, super important. And when I think about like the future of comics and the comics that I'm excited about, like that is the vision I have is like meeting the creators about the things that they are super excited for because that is the work that's gonna be really meaningful to people and the work that really reaches like new audiences. Um, so that's exciting for me. That's really well put, Hannah. Um, and it reminds me of, of the better feed version of the feedback that I think when people come to us and say, what are you looking for? And the, it's, it sounds like a cop-out, but the answer is like, we don't know yet. Like, we wanna see what you are doing because we wanna see w the thing that you can't stop yourself from making, you know, and the thing that only you can make that nobody else is doing. And, you know, let us see it and let us meet you halfway. Um, I think all of your projects sort of came to us you know, in basically those ways, um, even if it takes us sometimes 12 months to realize that you're a genius. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. yeah. uh, so for everybody out there uh, watching and here physically and whoever watches this recording later, like we, we're so excited about what you're going to do next. We can't predict whatever the next trend is, but we want to be there with you. And thanks for being with us along these 25 years. Um, we'll see you out on the floor and out in the world. and. And, Thanks so much. And real quickly, a, a real thank you to this man over here, Lee Walton, who's been with me for 15 years and has been a bigger part of our editorial evolution as anybody else. He's an amazing editor and marketing guy as well. So thank you, Lee. And also, everybody, I got some presents for Goodies. you. Goodies. If you want to come up, I've got some 25th anniversary coasters, but even cooler, I found these are 25 years old. These were the first marketing thing we ever made. Matchbooks done by Craig Thompson with a little devil and a little angel on them. And they're 25 years old, and they're the coolest thing we've ever done, I think, too. So, so come and grab one, and I'll meet you individually. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.